Hi everyone, salam and welcome. And thank you for being with us today for our round table capping off our fourth annual 2022 Halalawi Muslim Horror Film Festival, Muslim Horror in the 21st Century. My name is Aliyah Khan and I'm director of the University of Michigan Global Islamic Studies Center, which is your host today. I'm also an associate professor in the Department of English and the Department of Afro-American and African Studies. First, a little bit about us and Halaloween. The Global Islamic Studies Center aims to promote the understanding of global Islamic culture and Muslim societies worldwide, not just the Middle East, but Asia, Africa, and the Americas. If you're a Michigan student wanting to get involved with our center, please attend our events. But also, if you're an undergraduate student, declare our Islamic studies minor. The minor itself has no prerequisites and it's 16 credits. You can find more information on our website, but please also reach out and contact us and we can make sure you have everything you need to declare. If you're interested in graduate programs, check out our Masters in International and Regional Studies with an Islamic Studies specialization. The application deadline is mid-December, and you can also find more info on our website. The master's program is 36 credits total and is usually pursued over the course of two years. If you are a student, faculty, staff, or community member who's interested in our events, make sure you join our newsletter. We send out monthly newsletters, and you can subscribe at the link on your screen. And now, so a little bit more about our upcoming events uh, in 2022. After the Halaloween Muslim Horror Film Festival, the Global Islamic Studies Center has two major events coming up. On November 17th, we have Muslims in the Balkans on the edges of Islam in Europe with Dr. Armin Sinanovic. This is a first talk in our new Politics and Culture in the Muslim World series. Each talk in the series will focus on a different region or country in the Muslim world, centering places and regions that are underrepresented in U.S. discourse on Islam and Muslims. On November 29th, in collaboration with the Latin American and Caribbean Studies Center, we're featuring a Religion and Feminism Interface Author Roundtable, where we'll be talking about the intersection of feminism with Catholicism, Islam, and Judaism. This event will launch just published books by Dr. William Calvo Quiroz, one entitled Undocumented Saints, The Politics of Migrating Devotions, and another book by Dr. Jocelyn Fenton Stitt, entitled Dreams of Archives Unfolded, Absence and Caribbean Life Writing. I'll also be talking about my recent book, Far From Mecca, Globalizing the Muslim Caribbean, and Ken Chitwood, author of the book, Muslims, the Muslims of Latin America and the Caribbean will be moderating. Next semester in 2023, we have two exciting events to look forward to, another film festival, which is our very first African Muslim film festival, featuring films curated from Sudan, Chad, South Africa, Egypt, and more. In early March, we will also be launching a new book by Dr. Charlotte Karam Albrecht, entitled Possible Histories, Arab Americans and the Queer Ecology of Peddling. So on to the main event. Today's Halaloween Roundtable, Beyond the Films, Muslim Horror in the 21st Century, is one of the culminating events this week for our fourth Halaloween Muslim Horror Film Series, which is taking place throughout the month of October. Halaloween screens horror films from Muslim-majority countries that were made by for or about Muslims, with the hopes of understanding what scares Muslim audiences, are horror movies halal? First launched by the Global Islamic Studies Center at the Michigan Theater in 2019, featuring films like A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night from Iran, Dahra from Tunisia, Sijin 4 from Turkey, and more, Halaloween moved to an entirely virtual film series in 2021 because of COVID-19. This year, we're pleased to say that we are doing a hybrid Halloween with a final in-person screening tomorrow. Earlier this October, we hosted our three streaming films on the screening platform Eventive and screened one film a week released every Thursday, giving viewers the ability to watch on their own time. 
This year, our curatorial focus was on Muslim horror films from Southeast Asia and Africa with a folk horror theme. The 2022 Halloween lineup was Ruh, or Soul, from Malaysia, Bedua, The Curse, from Turkey, Satan Slaves from, Satan Slaves from Indonesia, and last but not least, Salum, which we will be showing in person tomorrow at Inn Ann Arbor from Senegal. Tomorrow's Senegalese thriller Salum, which as I mentioned, we're showing the, uh, in person, will be showing it, we'll be showing it in collaboration with the streaming horror film channel Shudder, and it will be at the State Theater at 7 p.m. tomorrow. Um, I think I should, I should just tell you that we are sold out, actually, but if you would still like to watch it, we have a promo code that you, we can use for you to watch it on Shudder, and that should be appearing in the chat right now. I'd like to thank all of our generous sponsors. Halloween is brought to you by the Global Islamic Studies Center and co-sponsored at the University of Michigan by the Department of Middle East Studies, the Department of Film, Television, and Media, the Department of Asian Languages and Cultures, the Department of Afro-American and African Studies, the Department of Communication and Media, the Department of American Culture and, the, and its Arab and Muslim American Studies program, the Center for Middle Eastern and North African Studies, the Digital Islamic Studies curriculum, the African Studies Center, the Center for Southeast Asian Studies, the Center for, and the Center for South Asian Studies. Thank you also to our external co-sponsors, the Center for Arab American Studies at U of M Dearborn, the Arab American National Museum, and Shudder. I'm happy to say that we have a lot of sponsors. Keep up with Michigan Global Islamic Studies and all of our events by signing up for our newsletter and following us on Twitter or Facebook. So today we're delighted to welcome four scholars and experts to our Halloween roundtable on Muslim horror. Our moderator and first speaker is Dr. Carla Millet. Dr. Millet is a professor of Italian in the Department of Romance Languages and Literatures and a professor of Mediterranean Studies in the Department of Middle East Studies at the University of Michigan. She is the author most recently of Lives of the Great Languages, Latin and Arabic in the Medieval Mediterranean, and numerous articles on medieval literature and Mediterranean studies. She is the former director of the Global Islamic Studies Center, and she is currently the chair of the Department of Middle East Studies at the University of Michigan. Dr. Ali Olomi is an assistant professor of history at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California, and an affiliated scholar with the Rutgers Center for Security, Race, and Rights. He is a historian of the Middle East and Islam, researching, writing, and publishing on medieval and modern Muslim thought. He studies how Muslims imagine the Islamic world at the intersection of religion, science, and empire. Dr. Olomi's research examines the Muslim imagination of the monstrous through the jinn, the early history of astronomy and its role in empire building, and Islamic apocalypticism and cosmology. Dr. Olomi also has the greatest Twitter on jinn and the Islamic supernatural, which you should follow. Dr. Eki Imanjaya is a faculty member in the film department at Bina Nusantara Binus University in Jakarta, Indonesia. In 2018, he finished his doctoral studies in film studies at the University of East Anglia in the United Kingdom. Previously, Dr. Iman Jaya got his master's degree majoring in philosophy at Universitas Indonesia, as well as in film studies at, at Universiteit van Amsterdam in 2008. Dr. Iman Jaya is a film critic specializing in Indonesian cinema and a board member of the Madani Film Festival and Jakarta Film Week. He is also a film critic and has published his articles in many popular magazines, newspapers, and academic journals, including Cinemaya, Colloqui, Plaridel, and Asian Cinema. He has published books on Indonesian films, pop culture, and Islamic cultural issues, including the books Menkari Film Madani, Cinema Dan, Dan Dunia Islam, and Mujahid film, Usmar Ismail, 99 film Madani, and with Hikmat Darmawan, with Hikmat Darmawan, and the Indonesian translation of his doctoral thesis. 
Dr. Iman Jaya is currently the chairperson of the Film Committee at Jakarta Arts Council. And we very much appreciate Dr. Iman Jaya joining us from Indonesia, especially as it is 5 a.m. there. Dr. Rubina, or Ruby Ramji, is an associate professor of religious studies in the Department of Humanities at Cape Breton University in Canada. Her research focuses on images of Islam in numerous and various media discourses, including film and television. She also works on issues of gender, ethnicity, diversity, and multiculturalism. Dr. Ramji is co-editor with Alison Marshall of the Bloomsbury Handbook on Religion and Migration, and with Peter Bayer of the book Growing Up Canadian, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists. She is the author of articles and book chapters, including Examining the Critical Role American Popular Film Plays in Maintaining the Muslim Terrorist Image Post 9-11, which is in the Journal of Religion and Film, Maintaining and Nurturing an Islamic Identity in Canada, Online and Offline in Religion and the Public Sphere, and Muslims in the Movies in the Bloomsbury Companion to Religion and Film. Dr. Ramji is the film editor of the Journal of Religion and Film and served as senior editor of Golem, journal, the Journal of Religion and Monsters for four years. She was a chair of the Religion, Film and Visual Culture Group in the American Academy of Religion for six years and past president of the Canadian Society for the Study of Religion from 2012 to 2016. So our format today is that each person will speak for about 15 minutes. At the end of the discussion, we'll have time for Q&A from the audience. Your mics are muted for this webinar, webinar, so please submit your questions using the Q&A function, the icon at the bottom of the screen. So please welcome our speakers for what will be a fascinating Halloween Horror 2022 discussion, and I will turn it over now to Dr. Millett. A real pleasure to participate in this, technically our third Halloween um, and the second Halloween panel. Um, the weird thing about the movies that we screened this year is that there were no Arab movies in that list. I wanted to talk about two movies from the Arab world that we screened, but we chose not to show. They're both great movies, but they're not really on brand for Halloween. Both movies do what horror does very well. They are unsettling. They make you think, and they stay with. They stayed with me at least after I saw them. I kept on thinking about them after I saw them. But both involve sexual violence, and that's not where we want to take our audience. Now, before I begin, I want uh, to send a huge shout out to Hanam Matar who is program coordinator for the Global Islamic Studies Center. She was the one who first proposed the name Halloween for this series back in 2019 before we ran it for the first time. And she takes up some really interesting movies to screen every year. She uh, is, we're all out there looking for the treasures, but Hana, I think, finds the deep cuts. I think because she's got some mad Google skills, because she's got some great connections, she passed on the names of both of the movies that I'm going to talk about today. And here I'm going to um, share my screen, start my PowerPoint so that you can see the movies that I'm talking about. Uh, she passed on the names of both of these movies. They're both visually gorgeous movies. They both have a sort of dreamlike quality or a nightmare quality, given that we're talking about horror. Um, both involve sexual violence. So content warning. You will not see any sexual violence in this presentation, but if you watch the movies, it's there. Both are revenge movies featuring women who are both victims and perpetrators of violence. And they're both streaming in case you'd like to check them out. Now, first of all, Kandil al Bahar, Jellyfish. This is a gorgeous little movie from Algeria, came out in 2016. It's a very short movie, it's just 40 minutes long. It was directed by Damien Aounouri, and it stars Adila Bendimerad, who also wrote the screenplay, and Nabil Asli. They are both superb actors, and their performances are the heart of the movie. It's set in an Algerian coastal city. The camera takes full advantage of this setting. The cinematography is really gorgeous in this movie. 
At the beginning of the movie, a family sets out for a day at the beach. The father has an appointment, so he drops off uh, his wife and their two young children, along with their grandmother, the wife's mother. So Nafisa, she's the wife and mother. Um, she is swimming out of sight of the shore, and she is taunted, attacked, and finally murdered by a group of men. This is a brutal scene. It lasts just under five minutes. I've watched the movie a few times, and I couldn't watch the scene. I had to look away during the scene every time. And that's why we didn't screen this movie as part of the series. After her death, through a process that is not explained in the movie, Nafisa becomes a kind of avenging sea monster. There are transformations to her body that are hinted at rather than explicitly shown as she kind of slowly becomes a creature of the sea. She was an amazing swimmer in life, a graceful, gorgeous swimmer in life, and there are long poetic shots of her swimming before she's attacked. After her death, she is she becomes uncannily fast and strong in the water, and there's something increasingly savage about the way that she swims. She becomes increasingly animalistic. She's bent on revenge against those who killed her. While we're watching her target and kill those who were responsible for her murder, we also follow her husband, who is desperate to find her, and a man who seems to be the sheriff or the chief of police of this town. The husband becomes increasingly frustrated with the sheriff's apparent authoritarianism and incompetence. We know that this character is a bad guy because, first of all, he wears a leather jacket to the beach where there are families swimming in, you know, normal swimming costumes. And because he fires his sidearm into a crowd of families in an attempt to control them. So he's brutal. And the, the movie balances the sheriff's brutality by showing us the love between Nafisa and her husband and her husband's anxiety and fear on her behalf. The sheriff seems to understand what's happening. He, uh, um, apparently it's a thing that happens to women in this town, presumably specifically to women who die at the hands of men. They turn into avenging jellyfish. In fact, the sheriff seems to think that this is all Nafisa's fault, that she chose to go full jellyfish, that she, not the men of this town, is the aggressor. So we watch Nafisa get her revenge. We watch her hunt down the men who killed her. Then we watch the sheriff and the men of the town hunt her down. At this point, she has become a hybrid woman fish creature. Now, Kendil is short. It's only 40 minutes long, as I said. So her fate plays out very quickly. This is this movie uses poetic, gorgeous, uh, economic cinema, uh, storytelling. And it uses classic horror movie tropes to tell its story. Nafisa becomes essentially a horror movie monster. The movie makes us both sympathize with her and fear the violence that she unleashes. So it ends up feeling kind of like a mashup of a Greek tragedy and a classic monster movie. And the fact that at the center of this movie is a kind of a, a clammy, pale-skinned, avenging female character it's, it also gives the movie a hint of vampire movie DNA. And I bring that up because it's relevant to the second movie that I want to talk about, Black Medusa in English, and in Arabic, Matas Canary, or What You Heard Was the Wind. Black, Black Medusa tends to be compared to Girl Walks Home Alone at Night, and there are some similarities. It's shot in black and white. It centers a female character who is also a predator. It has a kind of dreamlike quality punctuated by scenes of intense violence. There are lots of beautiful long shots of a woman walking alone against the backdrop of a city at night. So lots of similarities to Girl Walks Home. It's also sometimes compared to a promising young woman because it's a revenge fantasy about a woman who stalks men as payback for the violence that she herself suffered at the hands of men. I would also compare it to the lesbian vampire movies of the early 70s, like Daughters of Darkness or The Blood Spattered Bride, because it's not only a female revenge story, it's also queer horror. 
It's full of moody scenes where the central female character watch, walks the streets of Tunis at night, gorgeous cinematography, and these shots, this urban architecture, empty city streets, nightclubs seen through big glass windows. These shots are kind of hypnotic. And the music is great too. Actually, the soundtrack, soundtrack is wonderful. As in those lesbian vampire movies of the early 70s, especially Daughters of Darkness, Black Medusa becomes something of an obsessive meditation on the place where it's set. Daughters of Darkness is set in Ostend, a Belgian seaside resort during the off season, and Black Medusa is set in Tunis. And like Daughters of Darkness, the cinematography and the art design of the movie is almost as compelling as the characters, although that movie, Daughters of Darkness, is very colorful and uh, Black Medusa is uh, in black and white. The violence in this movie is horrific, though. Massive content warning on this one for sexual violence if you decide to watch it. And you can get a free um, trial subscription and watch it streaming on movie right now. The central character, Nada, is deaf and mute, or apparently she plays at being deaf and mute because it turns out that she really can hear and talk. She uses a voice-to-text app on her phone to communicate, but only when she's talking in French and not in Arabic, which is a little odd. She picks up men in nightclubs and goes home with them, and then she murders them. In one case, she also sexually assaults her victim. That's her M.O., the violence happens mainly off screen, but it's still intense, and that's why we didn't screen it this year. It seems that Nada herself has been insulted in the past and that this is her revenge, although the movie never actually spells that out. So she's not a true vampire, although at one point after she has finished off a victim, we do see her in a classic vampire movie shot with a blood smeared mouth, but her weapon of choice is a knife. She's an avenging angel who sheds her victim's blood. And ultimately, of course, Nada herself will be stalked and attacked because that's how horror movies work. Whether it's a lesbian vampire movie or a monster movie, the central character typically ends up being the target of violence by the end. <clears throat> So the first act of the movie sets up Nada, the protagonist, as a avenging monster. In the second act, we're introduced to a new character, Nura, a woman who has just moved to Tunis from Algeria and who works with Nada. The friendship between Nada and Nura is never defined, but they're definitely something more than co-workers. Nura learns that Nada actually can talk, but chooses to use the voice app, although again, the movie never tells us why that is the case. Is this an effect of the unspecified trauma that she experienced? It's, it's unclear. The name of the movie in English comes from a scene toward the end of the movie. Nada visits the archaeological museum in Sousс, and she sees this famous mosaic of Medusa. And then a bizarre scene follows uh, where she catches sight of a man and pursues him. He was watching her while she was looking at the Medusa. And this sequence may or may not connect to a dreamlike sequence early in the movie in which another herself was assaulted. It's hard to say. The movie is bookended by this sort of allegory or fable that's recounted in a voiceover in what must be the voice of the protagonist, although she doesn't actually speak during the movie. And what that fable means is anybody's guess. It's maybe a political allegory. The Blood Spattered Bride, that lesbian vampire movie from Spain, um, was released in 1972, so at the end of the Franco era, and it was received as an anti-fascist movie. So I suspect that this movie might be making a similar comment about fascism and dictators, maybe not clear. So the movie is not super coherent, but it is gorgeous and it's compelling. It seems that it was written and filmed by first-time feature-length filmmakers at breakneck speed, and it feels ambitious. It's an ambitious movie. It's staking a claim. It's making a statement about style, and it's a female revenge fantasy that the filmmakers made in rush. Like Jellyfish, it's hypnotic and dreamlike. It uses templates borrowed from horror to tell a story about female revenge. Both movies are also set in an Arab city on the Mediterranean and in Black Medusa, you see some shots of the beach along with the gorgeous footage of urban Tunis, mostly filmed at night. 
But while je jellyfish is, is, is very much about a heteronormative family and sexual violence between men and women, I see Black Medusa as queer horror. The relationship between Nada and Nura is never defined, but it is the most important relationship in the movie. And there's a very strong, compelling kind of um, connection, affinity, and friendship between the two women. So, and I think that's something new. I don't think that we've seen a, a, Muslim, a Muslim horror movie that really plays with queer horror tropes in the same way that this movie does. And finally, somewhat weirdly, another connection between the two movies that I talked about, Medusa is another name for jellyfish. Um, so, like I said, because of the sexual violence, these movies are not on brand for Hall Halloween. If we had all the time and the money and money in the world, we would have done a critics circle this year. We would have screened these two movies in a little screening room in Ann Arbor with a talk back after. We talked about doing that, but we just couldn't. We didn't have the bandwidth. But you can watch them at home if you're curious. You know, once again, content warning for graphic content, sexual violence for both of them. Um, Anyway, thank you for your attention, and I hope you all have a very, very happy Halloween. Um, so I will introduce the new, um, our next speaker is Dr. Ali Alomi. You've heard his bio, and we're excited to hear what he has to say about gin. So I'll turn it over to Ali. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Khan. Uh, um, we're, we can blame the gin for our technical difficulties. Uh, but hopefully everyone can hear me and uh, we don't have any further technical difficulties. Uh, I just want to start by saying thank you to Hannah and Dr. Khan and to the Global Islamic Studies Center for hosting all of us uh, and having this really cool conversation uh, around a very fascinating topic. I'm thrilled to be here and now I know who we can credit with that genius Halloween pun. Uh, so thank you for that, Hannah. That's fantastic. Uh, I've been chuckling about that for, for quite some time. What I want to offer today is a short presentation and hopefully open up the conversation around the concept of gin possession and what that offers for horror <laughs> in general. I want us to take a look at particularly gin possession and gin encounters with humans in Islamic thought and perhaps raise some questions about commonalities, differences, overlaps with demonic possession and ghost possession, and what this offers for the genre of horror in general. Let's start, as uh, academics like to do, with a definition. The jinn are a vaguely defined concept. They are referred to as hidden beings. In fact, the name jinn is related to the concept of a hidden world, al-ghaib. We have references of the jinn in the pre-Islamic Arabian Peninsula, but they're quite scant, and they likely were some type of entity related to the broader late antique beings like the Shadim or the genie of Palmyra or the genius in the Mediterranean. But we know that they eventually get co-opted into the Islamic cosmology and are featured in Orthodox Islamic thought. The Quran, for example, mentions, verily, we created humanity out of clay from an altered black mud, and the jinn we created before from scorching fire. Here, using the word samun, that's going to be important, so just put a little bit of an asterisk next to that as we come back to uh, samun. But the reference of the jinn in the Quran mean that unlike, say, ghosts, jinn are part of orthodox Islam. You can be a Christian without believing in ghosts. You can be a re religious and believe in ghosts. You can be non-religious and believe in ghosts. Plenty of people who have no religion but say, you know, I believe in the concept of ghosts. Jinn, therefore, are somewhat unique. They're built into the cosmology of Islam. They are, in many ways, a supernatural form of life. Indeed, it may be more accurate to see them not as purely supernatural, but as simultaneously supernatural and natural. They are an elemental form of life, and I have previously referred to them not as ghost phenomenon, but as an alternative parallel life to humans. We can see it in this particular verse. Humans are made out of clay. Jinn are made out of a scorching fire. Both have life. Both live. Both have needs. Both have desires. And both, at some point or time, will die and face the judgment of their creator. 
but they're different in their makeup. One is material clay and the other is this elemental fire. And the nature of that fire, samum, this scorching flame, this fire, this hot wind, plays an important role in the way that humanity encounters the jinn. In Islamic cosmology, we can see that God creates two worlds, the unseen world and the seen world. He's often referred to as Rabb al-Alamin, the Lord of the worlds. The hidden world or the unseen world includes angels and jinn, and the seen world includes humans and animals. And though the unseen cannot always be seen by the material world, they do interact. And it's that interaction that I really want to dive into. Because the jinn operate as an alternative form of life, as parallel to humans, their interactions with humanity are not exactly aligned with the way that, say, demons interact with humans or even ghosts do. Though jinn can encompass those phenomena, they're slightly different, and that is because of their makeup. Let's take a look at some of these encounters. I want to highlight a few of them which I think stand out in the medieval tradition in particular. The first is the encounter with the stranger. This is often seen through the only named jinn in the Quran, and that is Iblis. Iblis is often referred to as the Islamic devil or the Islamic Satan. But in actuality, he's quite different. Though his story follows some of the similar narratives of the Lucifer to Satan fall, he is not considered an angel. He is considered explicitly a jinn. And while there's some debate over why he was in heaven or why he was among the angels, the orthodox position comes to conclude that Iblis is a type of jinn, a name jinn. This means that the Islamic devil is very different from, say, the Christian medieval devil, who is seen as the adversary of humanity and the adversary of God himself. Indeed, he's often referred to in certain translations as the king of this world. If God is the king and ruler of the silver palace of the heavenly spheres, then the material world is ruled by this uh, creature. That is not the case in the Islamic understanding. After all, God is the creator and Lord of both worlds. That therefore makes Iblis not the rival to God, but rather the leader of a rival tribe to humanity. If humans are of a nation or of tribes, then Iblis is merely another tribe. The leader of that tribe, a powerful one, a dangerous one, and one clearly confrontational to humanity, but not an existential threat either to humans or certainly to God. He does not wage a war against heaven, but rather is the force of corruption that spreads evil and, and danger and chaos in the world. In this way, he embodies more the fear of the other, of the stranger, of the figure that enters into your city who you do not know and brings with them chaos and doubt and fear rather than a spiritual existential threat. Indeed, Iblis, for all his fearsome sort of reputation, can be driven away relatively easily. In fact, a simple invocation, I seek refuge in God from Satan the accursed, drives the devil away. So he's not a particularly powerful figure, even though he is certainly dangerous. This tells us that the first encounter with humans, with jinn, is that of the stranger. Jinn show up as animals, jinn show up as other people, jinn show up as mysterious figures in a person's life. Now, this has certain consequences for the stories that are told. The narrative is different. The jinn may be invisible, but they can take material form. They can show up as the other. They can show up as this mysterious figure. So that's one way that they manifest as not a existential threat, but rather a form of rival life, a rival tribe that coexists in this universe with us and can sometimes clash with us. The second way is via disease. The jinn, the closest that we have to real possession in the medieval Islamic tradition, is the ability of the jinn to inflict disease. 
Jinn are said to have what's known as ta'en. Ta'en are arrows or spears, which they fling at humans, and this causes an overheating. In fact, the word plague, ta'un, comes from this idea of the jinn's arrows. Here, this image on the left is of Al-Amar, the jinn king of Tuesday and Mars, who is infamous for his ability to cause plagues. Their ability to cause plagues is related to their nature out of Samum, that scorching heat. In other words, disease and plagues are seen as an abundance of hotness, of fire within the body. It is an infection that inflames the body, causes fevers and overheating. It's the excess of the humors of hotness and wetness. What does this mean? It means that when you experience possession, you are not necessarily having a spiritual encounter, but a medical experience. Indeed, the encounter with the jinn produces a natural phenomenon, disease. It produces illness. And how is that illness treated? Through a medical procedure, ruqaya, or the healing practice uh, that is spiritual, that involves prayers, that involves cleansing, is not about spiritual battle, as we often see in the case of exorcism, but rather about spiritual health, about restoring harmony. So take, for example, how exorcisms are often portrayed, the use of holy water that is flung onto an individual who has been possessed by a demon. The holy water burns and drives out the demon. Water is also used in ruqayah practices. Verses of the Quran are recited and then blown into the water, or they're written down on with ink on paper and then dissolved in the water, and then the water is drunk, not because it burns the jinn, but because the cooling and healing nature of the Quran will restore health. In other words, the encounter here once more plays with the idea that the jinn are simultaneously supernatural and natural. They also have this ability to affect disease, and this is going to matter when we talk about horror. So again, put a little asterisk here. We'll revisit this, particularly when we talk about the idea of comparing the different forms of possession. The third encounter is quite literally kidnappings, in which the jinn will bodily take someone and disappear them. We have various references in the medieval lore about people vanishing for years on end, and because they've been taken to the hidden realms, to the unseen realms, to the jinn realms. Sometimes they will continue to live their lives among the jinn, never to return, and other times they can be returned. This, for example, is seen in two popular stories, one from the medieval tradition revolving the jinn king Maimun. In fact, if you see here on the 14th century image of Maimun, he's kidnapping a human being. You can see the human being carried in his arms. One tale says that a beautiful woman walked up to the roof of her house where a jinn ifrit immediately fell in love with her and absconded with her. He flew down, grabbed her, and disappeared. Her father, horrified, went and visited the local Sufi saint, Abdul Qadr, and asked, oh, Abdul Qadr, please help to return my daughter back to me. Abdul Qadr instructed the man to go out to the ruins on the outskirts of the city to draw a line in the sand and then to wait. He did this at night, and slowly but surely, creatures started to appear. Jinn in all sorts of forms and shapes and sizes, different bodily uh, manifestations, came up to the line, watched, and walked away. He waited as line after line of jinn came forth until finally a grand jinn, a mighty jinn riding upon a great steed, rode up to this line. He introduced himself as the Jinn King Maimun and asked the man, why was he there? The man said, I have been sent by Abdul Qadr and I'm asking for the return of my daughter. The Jinn bowed his head down, knelt and said, we recognize the authority of this Sufi saint, Abdul Qadr, we will find your daughter. He has the Afrit come forth. The Afrit had stolen the girl and flown away to China. China features quite frequently in a lot of these jinn stories. He has the jinn decapitated and he returns the daughter to her. This is frequently found in the medieval lore about the jinn having a bodily experience. You can be taken away bodily. It's not just spiritually, but you can disappear. In contemporary discussions and discourses of the jinn, we find similar things. For example, a recent interview with a Malaysian woman talked about 
She discussed how her son had disappeared, an old man in his 20s. She believed that he had been kidnapped by the jinn and now was living among the jinn, happily having a separate life, had gotten married to a jinn wife, had half jinn babies, but that he could never return to the human realms. In other words, what we see is a very different experience than, say, what ghosts and demons do. The jinn straddle the world between the unseen and the seen, and their encounter with us is both supernatural in their ability to sort of disappear you or cause disease, as well as natural kidnappings, disappearances are natural phenomenon, diseases are natural phenomenon, encounters with strangers are natural phenomenon. These encounters offer an interesting provocation and questions for the genre of horror. When we talk about horror, we talk about the experience often of demonic possessions, but the two are quite different. Jinn and demons are not synonymous with each other. First, jinn are simply taken for granted. Their existence are, is acknowledged, and that immediately raises the question, what is our relationship to the unseen? When you will gather around, and every Muslim who has grown up in a Muslim household or anyone who has grown up in an Islamic society can tell you that everyone has that social experience of getting together late at night and your cousin tells jinn stories or your great uncle tells jinn stories. And the jinn stories never involve explaining what the jinn are. They never involve trying to convince you that the jinn are real because everyone takes for granted that the jinn exist. That does something epistemologically. The cosmology already accepts that humans are not alone. That's a different narrative in horror. That's a different horror narrative. That's a different scary story. In contrast to say ghost possessions or demon possessions or ghost hauntings in the house, the very first step is the need to prove that the haunting is happening and the acceptance by the people that there is the unseen. When people move to a house, Strange things happen, but they don't immediately go, ah, yes, that's a ghost. Oh, no, we're possessed by a demon. There's an element of having to confront that their material reality is not the only existence. That in of itself provides an epistemological and existential crises for the victims of horror. How would Muslim horror look if it takes simply for granted these supernatural slash natural things automatically happen? They all, you are not alone. That's a very different experience. So the jinn versus demons, I think it can offer up a way for us to rethink the genre of horror, to rethink the role of the supernatural, and of course, to rethink the boundary between the so-called rational versus irrational. After all, if you ask a Muslim, there's nothing irrational about believing in the concept of the jinn. Humanity is just one part of a massive diverse, majestic creation, of course, alternative forms of life exist. Jinn encounters are also more varied and they're ambiguous. We talked, for example, about diseases and encounters with strange tribes and disappearances, but they're not always seen as destructive in those encounters. The encounter with the stranger can be a good thing. We have accounts, for example, of jinn who show up and then teach healing and medicine or poetry to the people that they encounter. It's a strange encounter. It's an uncanny encounter, but it is constructive. Even the disappearances, people can go and live in the jinn world. Even possession itself, that is the body being taken over by a jinn while manifesting in the form of a disease can also be constructive. Here I'm thinking about African Islam. And for example, the encounter with the jinn Sidi Shamhurish, or the czar rituals of Sudan and Egypt in which possession is invoked by the healer and practitioner as an act of mediumship. The jinn then operates copacetically with the human in the human's body, speaks through their voice and does various acts of charity and healing. Whereas demonic and ghost possessions in horror and depictions are fundamentally disruptive in nature. They also assume a different threat. Whereas the encounter with the jinn is the threat of the other, the threat of the thing that exists just beyond the borders, at the edges of our eyes, the threat of the ghost and the demon is to the bodily sovereignty of the person. Think, for example, in the movie Exorcist, the sort of iconic movie of possession, how the body contorts when it is possessed. 
or the very first experience that something is wrong is when the young girl loses control of her bladder. This is a threat to bodily sovereignty, to control over your body. The body is twisted and contorted, whereas possession can be either constructive with the gym, or even when it is disruptive, it is a healing process in which the body is ill and is in a state of imbalance and must be restored through healing, cooling, and cleanliness practices. And then, of course, we must ask about the framework. The jinn are far more amorphous in nature. Because they're not always clearly defined, they're a sort of fiery creature, it allows for the jinn to be Islamized when you arrive, when Islam arrives at various cultures. And it allows for those creatures to in turn take on and become syncretized with the jinn. So we find, for example, that the Chorel in South Asia will is associated with the jinn. It allows the jinn to adapt to local beliefs. Indeed, in the case of Satan's Slaves, which was the film that was streamed this past uh, week, the Pokong, which is a ghostly entity, an entity coming back from the dead, is sometimes syncretized with the jinn in various Javanese uh, discourses. We find the same thing in Malaysia and Indonesia and Africa, South Asia, in which local entities and beliefs can become syncretized with the jinn. On, in the contrast, demons and ghosts often fit within a very strict Catholic or evangelical framework. If they exist, they are an enemy of God. There isn't that ability to adapt. You know, we exorcist is a prime example of it. The main, main demon in the exorcist is Pazuzu which is a Mesopotamian spirit. And in fact, a protective deity in traditional Mesopotamian ancient lore that is recast into the roles of an evil demon. And then my final sort of thing, and I'll end it here, is really the question of what will be the effect of globalization and the influence of Hollywood. The jinn have their own cultural context. They have this adaptability. They, have, they speak to different fears and anxieties and different encounters. As we see more and more Jinn movies adapt, will they adapt to the Hollywood narrative? Will they adapt to a more familiar horror genre in which the uh, sort of trope is that of possession? Or will it be the encounter with the stranger? Will we see instead the influence of the amorphous nature of the Jinn on the nature of Hollywood, on the nature and genre of horror films? Will we see a more amorphous encounter with the spiritual supernatural other, or will the jinn fall in line with horror? These are some questions that I hope that opens up some conversation amongst us, and I'm happy to be in dialogue with everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ali. That was so fascinating, and I have tons of questions, as I'm sure everyone else does. Um, so it's now my pleasure to uh, ask Dr. Eki Imanjaya to take over. Thank you, Alia. Um, let me do the share screen. Okay. I hope it's 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 working. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everybody. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, and good morning, because it's morning in Indonesia in Jakarta. Uh, today I'm very happy, and I'm very honored to for being here. Thank you for the invitation, and. Uh, uh, Today I'm very very excited because first, of course, uh, this uh, Halloween event, and the second one, I just watched Kodrat. It's uh, Kodrat is a new film about Rukia. So Ali already mentioned about Rukia engine, and uh, uh, yesterday or today in um, uh, in the U.S. Uh, time was uh, the the, uh, the first screening uh, commercially. So I will let me share uh, my experience. And today I'm going to have a like a, a, a glance of uh, introduction of what I call Indonesia's Madani horror, as well as pochong film. Ali already mentioned about pochong in Satan Slave. Uh, okay, uh, let me start. Okay, I will begin with the New Order era uh, in the 1966 to 1998, where the most of uh, horror films in Indonesia always had uh, the, the Kiai or the Muslim cleric or the, the, the Sheikh and the Sheikh always won because that that was part of the censorship regulation. Uh, and then uh, according to Karl Heder, there is no good versus evil in Indonesian uh, 
films in the general, especially in horror, but as all, but the order and disorder, it's, it's what the uh, Kali Heder uh, highlights uh, because of the uh, because uh, part of the uh, censorship regulations. So it's disorder and then back to order. And Indonesia at that time, they were being uh, you know possessed or <laughs> uh, you know, obsessed with the cultural educative films, films with cultural and educational uh, purposes and so on. And try to find the true faces of Indonesian culture. So they, but the, the on the other hand, uh, horror movies with clerics, with Muslim clerics, and Kiai and so on, uh, they became uh, uh, mainstreams yeah, in Indonesia, but uh, marginalized by New Order regime at that time. And then in 1998, after the New Order regime uh, stepped down, there was an interesting uh, trend. First of all, it's uh, the scholarization. So no Kiai ap appears anymore, starting with uh, Jelangkung. Jelangkung is an Oja board uh, game, something like that. And it's an urban legend. And in some cases, the Kiai lost and died in Joko Anwar, Satan Slave. Oh, sorry, I just, <laughs> just do the. But it's, 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 it's not that spoiler. But yeah, it's, the Kiai is lost. Uh, and then in the, the films at that time, uh, were influenced by MTV and Asian horror, and they even had horror actresses, Sasha Gray, Sora Aoi, and local celebrity, uh, sexy celebrities, and so on, and urban legend, and so on. So uh, there, there was no single uh, films in, uh, in the context of uh, having kiais or having uh, religious elements in the, in the movie. Instead, they have a biopic of significant figures, like historical figures, finding or the, the themes include finding spouse in Islamic ways, you no know, dating, and so on. And it's more into the you know the, the doctrinal Islam and sp personal spiritual journey instead of the social movement and so on. And then going up studying abroad, and then Muslim proud because Muslim uh, Indonesian Muslims. As part of a global, you know, a global uh, civilization, you know, like uh, so, it's that kind of, of films and less about horror until in the last I think 10, 10 years, 10, 5 years, there were some uh, films with the popular genres, not necessarily horror, but thriller and action and so on related with, for example, pesantren or Islamic boarding schools uh, uh, involved in as, as a setting, lo location. And then, of course, the, the both films here, pesantren impian or uh, dream uh, dream uh, Islamic boarding school, and three Alif Lamim were located in uh, pesantren or Islamic boarding school, for example. And since I mentioned about uh, Madani, I am part of Madani Film Festival uh, as a board, and uh, it started in 2018 in Jakarta, and this was our first uh, film festival. And uh, the the lady with the hijab is uh, Aida Bejik, uh, a female director from Bosnia Herzegovina, and we had her film uh, Never Leave Me as the opening. And then I also uh, wrote a, a book, Finding Madani Film, and then in 2019, and then uh, 99 Indone uh, Madani Films with Hikmat, which just launched at uh, our this year's uh, Madani Film Festival in, I think it's in, in, uh, in uh, last two weeks, yeah, also in October. So, what is Madani? I just have a, a short explanation. It's about uh, celebrating the diversity of the new Muslim, uh, new uh, Muslim uh, world or Muslim cultures. Not necessarily horror, but horror, I think, is an important part of, of it. And we celebrate the living Islam, the living Islam, Islam uh, in the society. How Muslims uh, live yeah, in uh, in uh, uh, I mean uh, doing the their Islamic values and so on. So it's about the uh, 
the culture and the society, not the religion, actually, even though it's, they have an interconnection or interplay. And uh, Madani, the, the root of Madani uh, has a strong relation with Din or religion, way of life, of course. Most of you already know that, or Madania, or Tamadun, or civilization, and of course, Madina, the city. Or uh, this is important because uh, Anwar Ibrahim was the first, uh, I mean, the, the, the very important figures in Malaysia, was the, the one who used the term Masyarakat Madani as a civil society, civil society, in, uh, back in 1995. And uh, what is Velo Madani for me? Because there are so many definitions, so I decided to make my own decision. And uh, in uh, in the connection with the Madani Film Festival, so if the Madani Film Festival for me is not only a fashion festival, but also a, 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 a cultural movement. Yeah? So, but and I think uh, Halloween and Madani Film Festival should collaborate yeah? because we have so many uh, similarities and so many. Uh, Interest it is it the same uh, things, yeah. So it's about living Islam and about Muslimness and about the society, as I told you earlier. And one of the question on my mind was: there are many biblical films, but lack of Quranic films, like Ali mentioned. Yeah, we, we, uh, in Islam has so many folklore and so on. But I, for me, I don't see. The folklore come be becoming the becoming the, the you know uh, movies or series, and then including some you know some creatures like Dajjal, Ifrit, or uh, some other uh, genes. Yeah. And uh, when we I talk about uh, Madani as the as a definition, it's interesting because for example. Uh, I, uh, 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 Alicia Izzaruddin has a different opinion with me because she, Alicia Izzaruddin, I believe, was uh, one of the panelists in the Halloween last year. Uh, Alicia, uh, Alicia mentioned that he, uh, she uh, didn't include uh, Yasmin Ahmad films, for example, but I included Yasmin Ahmad films like Mu'alaf or The Convert yeah, as part of Madani uh, uh, films. And on the right, uh, of the my screen is uni. Many people in Indonesia don't consider uni as uh, Madani films. But in my opinion, uh, uh, related to Madani uh, film as definition, uh, uni is included. And then one of the one of the uh, the criteria is uh, the less lecturing, the better, uh, because. This, uh, uh, previously, there, there were so many Islamic theme films with so many lectures and preaching and so so on. But in Madani, the uh, the, the theory is the, the less lecturing, the, the better. So I will discuss about the, what is trending now in Indonesia. The first is Rukia films. Of course, it has a very strong relation with what Ali uh, explained earlier. Munafik is a movie, uh, it's a Malaysian movie, and Dabe the Possession, available on Netflix, is one of my favorite and uh, movie, and one of the scariest. Both discuss about uh, Rukiah, yeah, the possess uh, exorcism, but not just another pos uh, possession, uh, possess uh, stories or, or uh, uh, exorcism, but it's the like Islamic. Uh, uh, exorcism and for me as a Muslim is scarier because uh, for example when I get scared for example I, I recite some Quran Quranic verses to comfort me and to make, uh, to have a protection and that's not happening in a secular horror film in Indonesia they don't uh, care about the kiais or the Quran. But here, Munafik and Dabe, they have this, uh, there's some, you know, surah or uh, verses like Yasin, uh, Fatiha, or uh, Ayatul Kursi. Even in Munafik, they mention uh, Dajjal. They will come, uh, you know, uh, a stronger creature 
and they will uh, make you out of uh, Islamic ways. And his name is Dajjal, something like that. And Munafik, Munafik is, I think is available on uh, Disney Hotstar. And of course, uh, Dabe on Netflix. And Indonesia, it ha happened like Rukia the Asism and then Dogeng Mystic, but uh, they don't have a, a very, uh, uh, you know, a thick, a, a, a thick uh, Muslim ways, but those two are very, very good. And I strongly recommend Quadrat for next Halloween, but it's, because it's, it's very good for me. I, I will show you the, the, the trailer. Uh, Quadrat is, uh, I'm Gibah, Gibah is important for me. It's not, a, it's a well-made film, but it's not my one of the strongest or scariest films. It's about Gibah, you know, the uh, backbiting. And in the, literally the, 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 in, the, in the film, because in the Quran, it says like, when you do the bag baiting as if you eat your own uh, 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 family's uh, meat uh, uh, or, or uh, corpse. So then literally it happened <laughs> uh, in, uh, in the movie. And uh, the, the important, important thing is that when the, the, the one who did the Rukia, it, it, and the, the gene is it's called uh, Ifrit, the one who did uh, the Rukia is a lady, and on the, at the beginning he mentioned by the name of Allah and all of the Danyang. The Danyang, the Danyang is is uh, is you know uh, 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 spiritual creatures who believes living with us. So he also asks uh, protect uh, help as protection, not only for the God but also uh, spiritually to the Danyang. And in Kodrat. It's the same Rukia, Rukia films because uh, uh, the, the the guy do the the Rukia, and the they, the film even had the advisor from a Muslim cleric, so it's uh, as real as possible, and the, uh, it has a very good uh, action as or silat film and so on. I will show you the I will show you the the. Some of the only short, uh, short clips. Sorry. <laughs> If I have time, I will play uh, play some more clips. But... Assalamualaikum, Ustaz Kodra. Sorry for the, the sound. It's uh, oh, uh, yeah. I think I, I just need to to screen you the the quadrat. And uh, next, I will. And if I have time. I will screen some uh, clips from the Rukia, Rukia Sabzangre. I don't know if I can I can uh, formulate the the. 
the theory or something. Okay. Uh, so the first time, the first subgenre, subgenre is uh, the 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 Turkia. and the second one is uh, Makmum or Kanzab or Korin or Kodam films. Uh, Uh, I, I know uh, Ali will explain it way better than me. So it's about uh, Corin is a, a companion. So every everybody has his or her own uh, companion, uh, like a, a, the, the, the spiritual creature, and uh, and uh, and Hansap is is one of the jinn who you know who uh, who disturb people when they do this the solat. So it's very interesting because here. Uh, when most people think that we, uh, we can protect ourselves by do by you know reciting some Quranic verses or do solat, the jinn or the creatures, uh, on the other hand, disturb us while we are doing solat, while we are doing prayers. And, this, uh, and uh, in Kodrat, when when the Ustad, Ustad Kodrat, Kodrat is the name of the the the, Kiai, the Ustad, the jinn, as I think it's as soal yeah, the, the black dog, he uh he uh teach the the teach the the, uh, the kiai how to recite the quran so he the, the jinn memorized the quran instead of being disappeared or destroyed by the, by the by the quran so it's it's very scary for for people like me but wow we, uh, we do we, we recite the quran for recitation but here in this case it it's the other way around or something like that okay uh uh, okay, uh, and then the next. Uh, do, do I have time? How many time I left? And the, the, the next is the pochong. It's in uh, this one is interesting because I thought pochong has a strong relationship with uh, Islamic yet by Hudson or, but I did uh, some research with my Dimus research team with Naila Majestia and. Uh, Andranus uh, Merdi, but apparently Pochong uh, is not popular in other Muslim countries. And even though uh, we know that if we see Pochong or uh, a, a shroud ghost, it has strongly uh, related to Muslim zanaza or Muslims, you know, bodies, yeah, dead bodies, because it's part of the bur uh, burial uh, rituals, and it's becoming trending in Indonesia, but. We just wondered why that happened in uh, other uh, Muslim countries. Is uh, I just show you some of the pochong uh, uh, pochong uh, film. But actually, we have so, in Indonesia we have so many ghosts or or jins, yeah, like this one, uh, tuyul, susur ngesot, cendol bolong, kutilanak. Uh, of course, mostly female. It's also another uh, interesting discourse, yeah. And we have some pochong. We have a pochong with a very uh, well made. It's a, with a like uh, real closer to a, a pure horror or something with the horror a convention. The la, the, the third one is the the uh, parody or uh, 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 comedy horror. Comedy horror like this. Okay. Uh, I will. Um, yeah, let's wrap, let's wrap yeah. this up. And, um, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. We, can, we can discuss the other clips in the Q&A. Um, okay. If we have some time. So um, now I'd like yeah. to... Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and thanks. That was a very rich presentation. I mean, one thing we were, we've always just been impressed by is the breadth of Indonesian horror film. So I'm sure we'll have a lot to talk about there. Um, so next, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Ruby Ramji to take over. Hello, everybody. I'm humbled to uh, be invited to talk to you in a Halloween panel. My area of focus tends to look at how Islam is depicted in North American film, specifically American film. Um, so this time I got to watch film from other countries, specifically Islamic, that portrayed the Islamic idea of jinn or curses or shaitan in the films themselves. Um, the idea of the jinn has actually existed 
um, in American film for quite a long time. You can go all the way back to the 1940s. Uh, in 1945, we had A Thousand and One Nights where the major idea of a djinn comes from. Um, and the idea of a djinn living in a, in a lamp that provides wishes to people. Sometimes the djinn is a trickster, sometimes it's malevolent, sometimes it actually is kind and gives you the wishes. Um, but often you get very different themes that aren't often tied to Islam in itself. Uh, other movies are uh, that I'll just read off to you are um, Alal Din and His Lamp from 1948, uh, The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad from 1958, uh, 1964, we had The Brass Bottle, uh, 1967, we had Hanna Barbera do a cartoon uh, called Shazan. Um, all of these basically have these ideas um, that come through all the way up until the 1990s. But finally, uh, American film has started looking at um, the origins of the djinn in later movies. The Wishmaster probably from 1998 would be one of those that starts looking at that idea. Um, and then the djinn, Red Sands, Stranded, all of these American movies start bringing in uh, Islamic ideas about where the djinn came from. Originally, if you go back and look at Western movies, they tend to look at things of uh, specters living in the desert or a statue that gets broken and a curse is attached to you. So there's no understanding of what a real jinn is. Like Dr. Olami um, talked about that there are five different types of jinn, and the understanding of jinn tends to come out more in movies from where uh, the, the mythology and the history of jinn are known in countries like Turkey and North Africa uh, and Indonesia. And so these films um, end up having very interesting themes, bringing in Islam in very particular ways. For this particular um, uh, launch of Halloween, the films that uh, we watched that were online were Satan's Slaves, uh, The Curse, and Moreau. And what I found very interesting in all of these three movies, rather than uh, using um, Islam as a way to somehow um, fight the demon or the curse or um, the jinn that might be living there and causing all of the, the havoc and murder and death, um, that prayer was one of the major issues that came up in all of these three films that was required and not used, which caused the problems. So in Satan Slaves, I hope everybody watched these movies, they're wonderful. Uh, Satan Slaves um, basically looks at the idea of a woman who um, doesn't want to live with what has happened to her with the fact that she can't bear children. And therefore she um, goes to a satanic cult and they only exist in big cities. So in this movie right away, big cities are considered to be fearful. Um, and she goes to the satanic cult in order to bear children. Um, and it turns out that um, after seven years, that child needs to be sacrificed to Satan. Um, eventually, we find out that it's actually not sacrificed, but that that child, that last child, is actually born from Satan. Satan is actually the uh, conceiver of the child, and his wishes are to literally spread his seed along the earth. And so this is how he does it. But the reason that he's able to get into this household, into this woman, is because this family doesn't pray. They don't go to mosque. Um, and even when they bury the mother who dies from um, this horrible event that happens, um, you know, trying to warn them in a sense that this curse is about to happen to them, that this youngest child is going to be, uh, in a sense, Satan. Uh, we, we find out that the family didn't pray and the uh, Imam comes to them and says that the only thing you can do is pray. This is the one thing that will help you. This is also true in the movie, The Curse, which I find actually starts to look at um, American tropes of how film horror films are actually made. In the horror films in uh, America, the one person who tends to live is usually the innocent victim. Usually the virgin girl is the innocent victim. And in The Curse, what we have is uh, this young girl, Melek, who is literally bullied and eventually ends up having brain trauma and is paralyzed. And because of her innocence, we are told that it's what causes this curse to be placed upon those people who have caused this pain upon her. So her animosity has grown and she basically uses the name of Allah, one of his names, the 19th name of the 99, in order to create this curse in, uh, in, a, in a way to get even with the people who have done this malicious thing to her. And what is interesting is one of the three girls who did this to her, Edda, actually praised Allah to actually free her from her pain. 
and she is the most um, taken aback when she realizes that something horrible is going to happen to her because here she's actually starting to pray for what she thinks is the right thing until we find out that she's actually praying to cover up a trauma that she caused herself. And so all of the three girls literally um, have to pay for the punishment that they have caused upon this girl with this curse. And also in Uro itself, we have this um, story that's given to us about a creature that walks in the, in the earth and takes the form of a man um, and eats uh, children, especially and deer uh, and likes to eat their flesh. And uh, a stranger comes to uh, the village basically where this woman is living because she had found a young girl who killed herself and she lies that the young girl hadn't been there and that causes the problem. As soon as she lies, she is no longer innocent. She is no longer telling the truth. And then her family has to pay the price of this person basically placing a curse upon them. Um, this woman who basically wants to eat her children. And so um, when the stranger realizes that his daughter had been at the house, he actually tells her, when was the last time you prostrated? Telling her specifically that her lack of prayer, her lack of faith, her lack of attention to God is what caused her children to basically be taken by the stranger. And another element that came from that movie, which I found really interesting, is that it's the woman that is actually evil, this evil creature, and not a man. We're told it's a man. Uh, but for one of the few times, we actually get to see it being a woman. Um, also within these three movies, we're, we're told often to look for gender roles in films and how women are written into more powerful roles. And unfortunately, I find that these three films, even though they have, in a sense, focused very much on women in the films, the main characters in all of the films are women, we get to see that it's the women who are at fault for causing either the curse to happen for the jinn to occur or for shaitan to arrive for that curse to be made. Um, and so literally uh, what we're seeing in a sense is that uh, these particular films are kind of carrying out that trope of the female being the reason or the problem for there being evil in the world as opposed to helping cure the problem in the world, except for perhaps the curse where the young girl who is innocent is able to finally um, get her come up in, against the three girls who hurt her. And so in a sense, what we see is that these three films um, in, in the genre of horror are a very interesting way to approach film and focusing very much on the idea of Islam as uh, a center focus, but in a very tiny way in the sense that if you are faithful and you pray, you will be okay. And if you don't, you may actually end up being uh, cursed or possessed or have a, a horrible jinn come trailing after you. And so these films are very interesting in the way American films are being made about genies. Um, and that's the uh, American concept of jinn up until probably 1998. And now we see American films actually focusing more on the Islamic trope of what a jinn is and looking at the idea of it being um, a creature that is from the Islamic world and from the mythological world of these countries, and also including sometimes Quranic verses to help explain why these jinn are, in a sense, evil and why they've infiltrated our world. And so um, I was going to talk about the five different types of jinn that are out there, and Dr. Olami has done a very good job on that, so I'm not going to actually uh, take up more time with my presentation. I'll, uh, I would love to take questions from everybody and see what you think about the three movies that we actually screened. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ramji. I think it's clear how your presentation and Ali's, uh, you know, feed into each other. And I think there are lots of questions that we could, you know, put to both of you about the nature of gin and how they appear in films. Uh, so the Q&A session has begun. Uh, what we're going to ask you to do is type your questions into the Q&A. You can see the icon at the bottom bottom right of your screen, and I'll read them out and pose them to our, um, our panelists. So if I can ask all of the panelists to turn their cameras on. Uh, we already have quite a few questions, so let's just, uh, let's just get to them. 
We have a question, like we, we have a broad question for all of the all of our panelists to answer. Um, An attendee wants to know what your favorite Muslim horror film is. So let's just start off that way going around. How about we start with you, Ali? What's your favorite horror film? Muslim horror film. I, I forgot the name of it. It's either called Aisha or Kandisha, but it's the one about Aisha Kandisha. And I think you all screened it last year, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where I heard it from. And I actually went and watched it. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. <laughs> so it, it's quickly become my favorite. Um, but also because I'm very fascinated with the figure of Aisha Kandisha. And I thought that was a really cool horror movie. So if anyone's interested, definitely check it out. How about you, Eki? What's your favorite Muslim horror movie? Or Indonesian film, I chose uh, Godrat, yes, I just watched, and for global one, I chose uh, Dabe the Possession. It's mm. the scariest movie I've ever watched <laughs> yeah, on Netflix. On Netflix. Thank you. How about you, Ruby? Um, for me, I think it would be Under the Shadow, um, which is a really interesting movie in the sense that it's uh, basically the Iran Iraq war, and uh, Iraq basically drops a bomb uh, on a building in Iran, and on it are written. Uh, Arabic scripture, and we find out that that Arabic scripture literally has caused a jinn to show up in the building um, and ends up basically taking over this woman and her child's life and, um, you know, focusing on that. I just love the way that they impose that idea of taking something that is in the Quran and, in, and creating it as something physical in another country uh, in the middle of basically a political war that exists in real life. Um, to, to explain why we can use these horror images to understand reality. Yeah, I, I love that film, actually. And it's exactly for those reasons, the way that the political and the religious um, dovetail in the form, in the genre of horror. Uh, Carla, how about you? And we're so sorry for um, your, the technical difficulties. We cannot hear you. Maybe you can type your response in the chat uh, so that everyone can see. So the question was just, what's your favorite Muslim horror films? Uh, I'll move on to some of the other ones. Uh, I think I don't see uh, this one. This one is from Susan Mirza, um, but it's it may be directed toward everyone, but especially the people who talked about Jin. Uh, Susan is curious about what your take is around the depiction of the jinn in the movie 3000 Years of Longing versus their depiction in Ms. Marvel. And I'm assuming that, Susan, you might mean um, Ms. Marvel, the TV series, the Disney Plus TV series rather than the comic. So how about maybe we start with you, Ruby, and then uh, Ali and anyone else who wants to jump in on that question. I hate admitting this, but I haven't watched the TV series Miss Marvel on Disney, only because um, I am uh, I am a watcher in blocks. I don't like watching just one or two episodes. I like watching all of them at once, and so I need to set aside an entire weekend just to do that. Um, but uh, the character uh, of the Jin in Three Thousand Years of Longing uh, really fell into that idea of the trope of what original stories used to be of what the jinn were like in in American movies back in the 40s and the 50s, where you had these um, engaging uh, jinn who, whose characters uh, kind of you almost wanted to fall in love with them because they, they would offer you things that your heart's desire allowed you to have, um, but at the same time feel sorry for them for being trapped in this bottle. And I felt very much that we were going back to these original storylines, almost from A Thousand Known Nights, where you get this uh, romantic feeling of what a jinn is, as opposed to the uh, the tropes that come out for what we understand of that which possesses you or is a psychic vampire or things like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a love story to me. <laughs> Ali, how about you? And have you watched uh, Ms. Marvel on Disney Plus yet? Um, I have not watched either of those, <laughs> I must confess. I keep getting asked about it, everyone on Twitter, every time I do a Q&A, someone's like, have you seen Miss Marvel? Have you seen, and I'm like, I haven't watched either of these, I'm so sorry. I, kn I know Miss Marvel from the comics and the comics are phenomenal. Uh, they're written really well. Um, and and uh, I'm a big fan uh, of the author uh, who 
Aleph Unseen is also phenomenal, I think, in regards to depictions of the jinn and just depictions of, of uh, bringing in Islamic cosmology more broadly into that world. Um, but I have not seen uh, 3,000 Years, I think it was, of Longing at, or Miss Marvel. But when I do, I promise I will give my, my thoughts. Yes, you should definitely tweet out your thoughts. I think we would all be interested in hearing what you have to say on that. Um, I know I was struck by the introduction of the Jinn backstory in Ms. Marvel, um, you know, like immediately, right, in contrast to the graphic novel. So I wonder, um, I, I definitely have questions for the writers um, on why that choice was made. And I know a lot of people in the Muslim community do too, right? And there's been a lot of online debate about how the Jinn are portrayed in that, in that, um, in that series. Uh, we have we have a question um, for Dr. Eki um, from Ashika Paramita, who asks, regarding regarding the subversion of the subgenre where the jinn, instead of being cast away, is able to recite the Quran back to the human. I'm wondering if you, Dr. Eki, can speak to what kind of societal fear or anxiety this might be related to when the jinn is able to um, recite the Quran back to a person. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the thing is, in, in, in a Rukia film, the jinn does two things. Yeah. First of all, is is playing playing tricks with, with the human. Yeah, like, like he, he acted as if he is the billet, uh wife or son or something. And the second one is in Kodrat, in the case of Kodrat, is the the strongest gene, yeah? one of the strongest is the as as al or something, the 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 black dog, the black dog one, and uh, uh, in the in the formula of uh, Rukia Zabzangres, usually the the Muslim clerics he got you know in doubt because something happened like the son died or the family died something, so he questioned the 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 gods uh, the faith his his own faith, so the his power be became weaker and weaker and the, the jinn became uh, stronger and stronger so that's happened but the thing is even jinn because at the same time in 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 quadrat or in some other people and in other uh, movie uh, the the one of the villain is the another muslim cleric so it's like people can can wonder which one is more corrupt is it the jinn or the muslim cleric who misuse his or uh, uh, his power as a Muslim cleric, cleric and then which one is more scarier and which one is the monster and so on. So it's like question uh, we had in mind when we watch the movie. So, mm -hmm. so it's up in the corrupted, the corrupted religious uh, society. Uh, it's also the highlight of the, the movies. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I have a I have a follow up question just for for everyone. Just uh, the circumstances under which explicit religiosity appears in these films, um, like when Quran appears, when prayer appears. Um, it actually seems to me that um, the Indonesian films are much more overt. The, the, when when we were when we were curating um, films for this year's Halloween, the Indonesian and the Malaysian films that we watched, the Southeast Asian films, seem to be much more overt than some of the ones that were from the Arab world um, and from Turkey, even from Iran, uh, in terms of bringing in Quran and bringing in prayer um, and bringing in you know explicit performances of religion into those films. Do you all think that there is some um, is there is there actually a regional discrepancy or a regional difference here, and what might account for um, you know differences or in maybe comfort levels in terms of you know portraying religion and Islam explicitly in these films? Um, maybe we can just kind of take turns here. Um, Ali, maybe you might try first, and then Ruby and Eki. Yeah, sure. I think yeah, there is definitely a certain level of discrepancy, or when religion is portrayed, whether it's over or more subtle, uh, is is something that I, I find interesting. Um, the role of of marketing, I think, plays a big role as well. Who the films are marketed to, what is the audience that is going to consume and watch the films, and their levels of comfort. I often find that certain horror films are trying to that are trying to break into say so called Western, whatever we call that. Uh, audiences industries are a little bit more hesitant or their the role of religion is a little bit more downplayed because there's a sort of global understanding of where religion is is in Hollywood right uh, or in film depictions and so there, there is a sort of aligning that happens 
Oh, it's, sure. it's the narrative or it's the the Hollywood and we heard <laughs> a dog in the background that's very cute. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, or gin maybe. Uh, we, uh, there's a sort of aligning that happens. And so Hollywood has a particular narrative or a particular set of an aesthetic that it wants. And sometimes films often opt to align themselves with that aesthetic, whether it's for award reasons or for audiences. But there is an obvious discrepancy. And also, I think it raises the question of the role of religion in these societies and what's uh, being culturally depicted. Like, um, do they see religion in a more having a sort of softer footprint uh, in their societies versus having a more overt manifestation. Um, but there's also the question of what do we mean by religion, right? Is Do we mean just prayer? Do we mean the Quran? For example, Indian, South Asian films, 786, right? Is often shows up in a variety of different, is that also an expression of religion? Even if it's not explicitly linked to say, Bismillah rahman rahim or, or, or is are those also aspects of religion? So I think we have to ask, what is religion? How is it being depicted? And then, of course, the role it plays in sort of the global market. Right. Uh, Ruth? Yeah, I actually think that it, ha it lends itself to the idea of authenticity. Um, I find that uh, movies that come out of places like Turkey and Egypt uh, and Syria tend to already have the knowledge of the mythology and the stories that go with it of these creatures of these ideas of things that possess you or jinns or um you know um even iblis uh the ideas are already out there i find for uh, movies that come out of indonesia and malaysia that there's not always that knowledge that comes down to uh, the grassroots level that everybody knows what that is kind of like you know in uh, the western world everybody knows that you kill a vampire with a stake through its heart and you know wear garlic um, it's there's no there's no you know reason why we all know this but it's just part of popular lore and I think that um, in Indonesian films uh, specifically I think it lends a level of more authenticity to the film so people take it to understand that this is going to be based on truth of some kind um, and that's why I think it's in there and I th I'm actually seeing that more as well in uh, Western films as well I mean even in 3000 years of longing there was a lot of what um, is said in the Quran specifically about jinn uh, that was that's talked about in there and uh, you know how jinn are made and from fire that is smokeless and all of the different ideas that we do know um, and so I think that the western films are also adding that sense of authenticity now to films and saying that this is truly a Muslim uh, creature and it does exist and we should know more about it. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting take right that the knowledge is implicit um, and, 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 you know, therefore the audience doesn't need to be told that this is religious. And Eki, how about you? And then I'll, I'll, Carla, let's check in and see how your, aud your audio is doing after. So Eki? Yeah, uh, I believe that, that as I mentioned uh, earlier, the less lecturing, uh, the better. But for the Rukia films, it, it makes sense because they do the ritual and yeah? they do the practice. So it's, it's part of the story. But on the other hand, uh, in the case of Pochong films, they didn't have uh, anything to do with religion as, uh, uh, at all. The thing is, but this, the Pochong, the Pochong figure is very, very popular. So they exploit the, 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 the figure as a films. So if, if, I, if, I, if uh, I may, can I uh, uh, play like one minute trailer? I, would, I just want to show that the Pochong is very, very popular. Even people in Indonesia is more uh, scarier to pochong rather than COVID-19. So they use the pochong figure as uh, a tool to scare people to keep in the house while they are doing quarantine. And it's going viral until uh, South Korea, just, just one minute. Let's see okay. if we what have some time um, at the end of this. Uh, I okay. think we have, we have a ton of questions here lined okay. up from, from audience members. So let's see if we have a little bit of time. Um, Carla, if you're, if you're uh, let's see if your audio is working. I think there's a question here that's suited for you. Um, since you are, you are the person who, um, you know, began this film festival and that is, do you think horror movies are halal? And do, and, and then we can expand this to anybody uh, too after, do you interpret horror films as scaring ourselves and therefore making it, therefore making it haram? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. I think I'm 
say if they're halal. I can't be the. I'm not. A, I'm. I'm not. Uh, but you started the Halloween Film Festival, so I think you might be the first person. Who just, but remember, as the description that you yourself read, um, you know, it closes with the question: Are horror movies halal? And we started it in part in order to. I will say that the way that it started was with Hannah and I tossing ideas around. Um, and I said, what if we did a Muslim uh, horror film fest? Are there movies to screen? In fact, I saw that somebody asked that question as well. And I think that that's a really excellent question. How many Muslim horror movies are out there and what will be screened next year? Because that's an open question every year. You know, it broke my heart that we were not able to screen the movies that I talked about today because I thought that those were two of the most interesting movies I saw this year. But um, they just were not would not be right for our audience. Um, but um uh, but you know, when we were tossing movies around, we were looking for movies to screen. We were asking these qu this question: Are there movies to screen? Um, we found uh, uh, Munafik, which uh, Eki mentioned in his talk, and um, it we I watched it. Of course, I found it on YouTube um, and watched it immediately, um, and I thought it was great. You know, in that way. Um, and, um, we, and Hannah and I read the comments and, you know, one of the things that we saw in the, I mean, the, the comments, uh, the, the YouTube comments on Munafik are themselves, like you could just, we could just screen comments and that could be like, you know, a, um, an event for Halloween, um, because people love that movie and they believe, like one of the comments that we saw was, you know, Munafik, this movie is pure Islam. You know, some, some people do believe deeply that these movies are an expression of faith are a profound expression of faith. So it's not about scaring, you know, yourself. It's about a kind of reaching toward a mystery, you know, and in some cases kind of um, being confronted with a mystery that is un very deeply unsettling to you. So we always, you know, the description of Halloween always closes with that question, are mo uh, horror movies halal? Because it's kind of one of the questions that we want to raise. And I think that, you know, uh, it kind of makes it much less interesting if you try to just answer it, you know, like a... <laughs> <laughs> like um, I really am interested in whether you know how how any of you think that you know these kinds of horror films that provoke emotion provoke the feeling of being frightened um or or anything else uh, you know fear apprehension nervousness anxiety and so on you know can we actually qualify those as haram like if you think of for example um you know uh Muslim scholarly Islamic scholarly rulings on music um, from Al Ghazali and so forth that talk about you know the levels of the levels of how permissible it is depends on you know intent and whether it means to create emotion in you and so forth. So how can we think of it of it in that context? Um, I see Ruby, you're smiling. So how about you? Um, actually, I want to say of the three movies that were screened online uh, for everyone who got to watch those, I actually find those to actually be very halal because. <laughs> the the you know the stories themselves are to tell you that you should know your history you should know uh, what's in your country and you should know your faith but at the same time if you don't pray and if you're not a, a believer and you don't go to to, to mosque you're just not being a good muslim and that comes out in all three of them and i thought that was a very good uh, way of actually trying to put faith into these movies um as a way of trying to tell you that you should behave in particular ways otherwise you will fall prey to satan and to uh, curses and to these horrible, um, you know, jinn that are out there. So I think in that sense, we can say that perhaps they are halal because they actually try to, to give you a moral lesson, pray more regularly. Yeah. Uh, Ali, you want to jump in or anybody else? Yeah, I can, I can add a couple of thoughts. Yeah, I think they're, they're totally halal. I think uh, in many ways, they are an extension of the oldest impulse in religion to explore the unknown, the metaphysical, the beyond, the things we can't understand, the mystery, as Carla said, right? So of course, of course. I think in many ways, um, horror movies sometimes are good and sometimes not so good, but it, they always reflect what people have been doing from time immemorial, sitting around a campfire and telling stories and scaring the absolute shit out of each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you thought that Muslims didn't do that in the time of the prophet, you think that the Sahaba didn't do that, you think that the medieval Muslims didn't do that, then you haven't been reading very closely. These jinn stories have been around, these ghost stories have been around, they've been telling you, uh, you know, they've been talking about what happens when you don't pray, they talk about what happens when a person gets kidnapped by a jinn, they've been talking about possession since ever. So this is just the 20th and 21st century manifestation of a long religious literary tradition. 
Mm. Um, we have a comment or rather a tale since we are telling gin stories from an audience member, Basit Ali. And I think this, you know, I feel like this might be, I, I remember this comment appearing, this question appearing when you were, um, when you were giving us your presentation, Ali, because you storytell. Your, mo your mode of delivering information on gin is storytelling, um, which is very interesting. Uh, so Basit says, hearing you talk about gins being able to take human form, it reminds me of a story my grandmother used to tell us. My family comes from Baltistan, a village in the mountains up north in Gilgit in Pakistan. In the 50s and 60s, there is a tale about a man coming from working in the fields who is stopped by a woman who keeps insisting that the man feed him. He tries to reason with her that he has nothing but can feed her if she comes along with him and eats with his family. The, arguments get, the argument gets so insufferable that he ignores her and keeps walking ahead. The next day, he wakes up blind and stays that way for the rest of his life. There's also a tradition in the village of staying at the grave of a recently passed person for at least a week to 10 days, praying, reciting the Quran to make sure jinns or badrus don't take over the grave or the body. So many talk, uh, so much talk of jinn possessing animals and going into people's homes and trampling them in their sleep. I've been there a handful of times in my life. There's always been an eerie feeling there. Um, that's a really fascinating story. In your experience, is this um, you know kind of common, uh, especially in 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 that areas? And then maybe you can tell us what badrus are, um, because I don't know. Yeah, thank you for that, Basit. I think absolutely, without a doubt, uh, these are very common. And it, it really highlights exactly what I was trying to say is that the, the jinn in many ways embody a very different sort of anxiety or fear or an, an understanding of the unknown than, say, demons or ghosts do. Um, the jinn in many ways are the stranger. It's the thing that we know exists, but exists just outside the field of vision. Um, the edges of quote unquote civilization or or societies and how we interact with them. They can be simultaneously dangerous or they can be welcoming. The fact that there's a sort of almost hidden message to the story that Basset was telling us, how do you treat the stranger by mistreating them, not feeding them, not giving from yourself, which is a very Islamic impulse, right? Feed the hungry, feed the poor, feed the stranger, feed the orphan. By not doing that, there is then a punishment going blind in this instance. So that's a very different fear. You know, Pazuzu shows up in the exorcist and he's not looking for a meal. He's not looking to get fed. He's looking to cause disruption and destroy that little girl's life, right? That's a very different experience. And even the concept of the jinn um, appearing in an uh, uh, animal form is a particularly... Uh, salient one and one that we find quite frequently in the tradition. And I think it's useful for us to understand the jinn via animals because the jinn in many ways are categorized as a type of animal. So I always tell my students, don't think of jinn like ghosts or demons. Think of them like mountain lions. They exist in nature. They're out there. You probably don't see them because mountain lions are good at hiding. Uh, where there's that joke on Twitter that says, uh, if you see a mountain lion, it means it's not hunting you. So when you don't see it, it is hunting you. So treat them like mountain lions. They're kind of shy. They do their own thing. And every once in a while, human interactions with mountain lions can end poorly. The same thing with the jinn. That is a very different experience than, say, the encounter with the demonic, which is always disruptive, which is always dangerous, which is always evil. And so in this instance, we don't know if the original jinn was a bad jinn in Basset's story. We just know that in that instance, they, that jinn was offended. They were not fed. They were not given. And so there was a consequence. But we know that the jinn can also be disruptive if they take the form of an animal, enter into someone's houses and trample them. And the idea that Basa really was pinpointing is I've been to this place and there's always an eerie feeling. That is what the jinn embody. That sense that nature is not dead. It is alive. Whether you're in the forest, whether you're in the mountains, I don't care how rational you think you are late at night. If you're walking in that forest, I promise you, you believe you're being stalked or followed or watched. It doesn't matter how much you convince yourselves you don't believe in the gin or ghosts or whatnot. But the second you're in that forest in the dead of the night, every creak of the wood is a potential gin. And I think that's what the gin embody, that sense that there's something out there. We can't always define it. We don't always know, but it's best to treat it with respect. 
and accept that we sort of coexist. Yeah, that actually, I, I want to ask a follow up question there um, about you, you mentioned uh, how gin possession can be viewed as a medical situation, rather than one that is religious or spiritual, it's a medical crisis. Can you talk more about that? And maybe Ruby and other people can jump into and Carla. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah, it overlaps uh, immensely with medicine, both historically, the tradition, the medical discourses that we see that come out of the uh, medieval Islamic thought have a lot to do with jinn. And the jinn are both healers in some of that tradition, as well as the causers of disease. In fact, plague is more frequently seen as the providence of jinn, that it's them that causes plagues. Uh, indeed, there's a, a whole tradition about even trying to time when it happens, and it's when two jinn kings meet. When Maimun and Ahmar uh, Al-Amar show up together, they cause plagues. Why? Because of their unique makeup with fire and coldness and, and water. All of that causes a disease to be spread. And even the treating of jinn possessions is often treated as a type of infection in which you must be cleansed. It, ruqaya is a healing practice first and foremost. We often call it Islamic exorcism or Muslim exorcism, and certainly it can be, but it is very different in nature. Now, in horror genres, we often see ruqaya portrayed more and more like the classical trope of exorcism. But in traditional discourses and in traditional practice, it tends to be more healing. Who performs the ruqaya? The shaman like imam, the sheikh, the people who are indigenous healers are the people who perform ruqaya. And so how do they do it? It's generally some form of healing practice, the drinking of waters, the drinking of teas, the cleansing of the body. So cleanliness is something that is deeply associated with ruqaya. And indeed, possession itself, while it can be disruptive, is not always associated with disorder. It can be uh, a manifestation of order. Like I mentioned, the czar rituals in, in, in Egypt and Sudan invoke possession deliberately as an act of healing. So you want to bring on in Morocco Sidi Shamhurish because he can heal the body. So if a person has something wrong with them, the jinn enters the body, heals the body, and then leaves. So there's, the discourse around medicine is very strong when we're talking about the jinn. Thank you. Uh, let's see, uh, Ruby or Carla? Yeah, I would just add to that the 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 gin in movies can be wonderfully, wonderfully elastic and plastic metaphors. They can mean a lot of different things. They can be pushed in a lot of different directions. And I wanted uh, to shout out a movie that Ruby mentioned, Under the Shadow, where you know when the the um the, the missile bomb, whatever it is, enters that apartment, there is this strong sense that it's a presence of something that may may read as gin, right? That it brings that kind of fear and that kind of um, disruption and that kind of kind of, uh, um, um, it's clearly, it's a kind of clearly an other, uh, otherworldly being in the same way that gin often are. Um, and there it's, that's clearly not a medical a reading of the gin. It's something else. It's political. It's uh, um, to do with the you know specific de details in Iranian politics. I want to call it the movie because it's a really great movie. Also because students at the University of Michigan, well, humans at the University of Michigan, whether you're a student or not, the um, library at the University of Michigan is screening a bunch of horror movies on Halloween, as they always do. And the last movie that they're screening is Under the Shadow. You can see it at the Undergraduate Library at Michigan. Um, and I highly recommend it. It's just a great movie. Ruby, thoughts? Yeah, um, there definitely is an idea where actually a possession of a gin requires almost a science. And so in that sense, you can look at it as being a medical condition. I think of the Catholic Church and the idea of possession, that um, in order to truly say that you require an exorcism, you actually have to have um, you know, someone come from the Catholic Church who is considered to be a specialist to investigate whether or not you truly are possessed and whether you require an exorcism. And then the exorcism itself is a scientific um, experience that happens to you that only certain people can do because of the faith that they have. Um, and so I see that playing out in the ideas of when we see movies of gins that do possess you or other um, other names that we have, like the ghoul, which also is kind of a, a form of a gin or um, even uh, the afflict. Um, you, you have this idea that only someone who is a specialist, like perhaps an imam who knows certain things, uh, is able to do this. In, in the movie Satan Slaves, you know, it's uh, he's a scientist who writes these uh, articles in Maya, in this magazine, and everyone says, oh, 
you know, it's, it's just, it's all, it's all garbage and it's all made up. But for him, it's really science. And it's actually true because he actually is able to say that this is what's happening. Satan truly is trying to see the world with his seeds and impregnating women who want to have babies. And this is his way of going around it. So I do see that there is, is often this idea of science being brought into the idea of possession. Um, but um, as Dr. Millette said, um, the idea of jinn is very malleable and very um, fluid. It can take many different forms. It doesn't have to be something that can be removed with just medicine, but it can be, uh, you know, through faith or it could be even through guns. I mean, depending on what kind of horror movie you have, sometimes you can actually trap a jinn um, or kill a jinn. So there are different um, tropes that are taken when trying to depict them that don't always follow the true meaning of what they are, but encapsulates more of our fears about what we expect to happen to us when perhaps a jinn does show up and uh, possession is a large thing usually. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about how much what all of you said reflects the Islamic idea that jinn lead, jinn lead whole lives in parallel worlds. You know, they are not, they're not uh, unidimensional themselves. They are, they're, they're whole beings. Um, that's, that's really interesting. Uh, we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Uh, so Eki, maybe we can start with you. We have a question from Elizabeth Davey. Um, what is the difference in gender roles uh, between Muslim roles in US horror films versus maybe everywhere else? Um, you know, horror films from Indonesia or everywhere else. Um, I'm gonna, uh, you know, turn this question a little bit to ask um, if there's a there's an issue here about if women are seen as weak or blamed uh, for things like uh, spirit possession, jinn, and so forth. Um, I guess we can ask this question um, in the form of: Is there a difference? Is there a gender role difference in U.S. horror films and Islamic horror films? So maybe you can start by telling talking to us about it from the Indonesian perspective. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, in Indonesian context, uh, the the women, most of ghosts or demons, are women or female. I, I, I'm wondering why, but usually uh, uh, one of the questions uh, mentioned about Pontianak or Kuntilanak is like a uh, a lady died when being uh, being uh, when he was, she was pregnant or uh, get carried uh, the the baby uh, uh, something like that. So it's also uh, has strong relation with the maternal things or something. So it's not, it's beyond that because in Indonesia, women mostly are represented as weak and blame and has no voice, but also they became the, the, the demon. You know, in a, it's interesting because in Pengabdi Setan, in a Satan Slave, it's the mother, you know, who is the the the, uh, the, the main uh, character behind the, the chaotic situation. Is the is the mom? So the mom, the mother became uh, go became something demonic. That's interesting, and uh, and uh, well, of course that's uh, Joko Anwar's signature, yeah, because in all of his films, mother or you know, ma and uh, family they are not uh, represented as a good good, good thing, yeah. I, uh, particularly a uh, uh, pregnant woman, pregnant ladies, and uh, mother. So it's, it's it's interesting because not only be, being uh, blamed or a, a weak, but also became the the demon uh, itself. That's I, I I just wondering why, but there are so many uh, research about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that maybe suggests something about you know regaining power through uh, becoming possessed that we might want to we might want to think of. Um, we have a question here that is about um, the idea Shahroz uh, Sheikh write, writes, I'm thinking about the idea of morality that often gets synced with the genre of Muslim horror films. And how does that complicate the learning of Islam by isolating it from fear? In other words, the implication of being a better Muslim out of fear narrative being depicted in a Muslim horror cinema. So maybe, maybe let me, okay, let me paraphrase this a little bit, um, just to ask you that, uh, you know, the, 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 this question here is suggesting that in Muslim horror films, there's an implication of being a better Muslim out of fear, uh, that somehow, you know, jinn possession and so forth, um, and scary things cause you to invoke the Quran, pray and so forth. Um, so what might we wait? What might we make of that in terms of Islamic morality and Islamic ethics? Ali, I saw you nodding your head. Why don't you start us off? 
in the hot seat for that one. It's a very, it's a, it's a deep question. Out of your head. <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't have nodded my head. That was my fault. Uh, no, I, yeah, I, it's a, it's a deep, it's a deep question. It all, it raises the ethical question of like, do, do people believe out of fear? It reminds me of the uh, famed uh, Rabia quote, right, where she says, "Lord, if I worship you out of fear, cast me into hell. If I worship you out of desire of heaven, deny me heaven. But if I worship you out of love of you, do not deny me your face." Right. So wh why do believers believe? Um, but if we're being honest. As uh, you know, if we're taking the historical approach, fear does play a role in religion. We would, I mean, the ideal would be no fear doesn't play a role. We would believe for whatever reason, but sure. I mean, I'm I think here about The Exorcist and how it led to increased church attendance after the movie The Exorcist came out. Americans rushed the church, right? They they were like, oh yeah, we got to get back there because so. Does fear play a role in uh, religion? Sure. Is Should it? Maybe not. Um, I actually come from the idea that just a dash of fear is good. Maybe not overwhelming fear. Or fear that leads to things like uh, antipathy towards others or fear and hatred. But I think just a little bit of respectful. The world is huge. The universe is massive. We're a small speck of dust. And it's okay to every once in a while be like, we don't know, and it's it's fine to feel a little bit uneasy about the weird stuff that's out there. That is an entirely rational experience. In many ways, it reflects the nature of God itself, right? If you think of God as awesome in the classical sense of awesome, there is an element of, of, of fear. There's an existential, what happens when you accept that God exists as a literal presence, right? The if, contemporary equivalent can be aliens showing up what happens to your world review what happens to yourself so there is an element of i think unease there maybe not fear but unease with the unknown anyone else want to take that one i'll add a little something i actually see a lot of these movies um horror movies in general as morality tales i think of the uh, brothers grim stories you know how do you get children to behave properly don't go in the woods uh, don't eat you know uh, a witch's house because it's made out of wonderful gingerbread because something might happen to you. All of these stories which basically are training kids to behave properly. So morality tales in that sense. And I think that uh, you can take that also away from horror movies and that you should behave in a very particular way uh, in order for bad things not to happen to you. But at the same time, uh, you know, we walk out of there in a way knowing that it's fantasy, that these horror movies are fantastical. Um, but there's also that idea of also remembering a little bit of um, the morality tale of making sure that you behave the proper way every day so that you're not actually a bad person. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we are about out of time. So there's one question uh, left that I think, you know, if we can all take a round at answering, if you can all take a round at answering, um, we can end on that note. Um, we have a question about what inspired you all to focus on Muslim horror. You know, why horror? especially in the genre of Islamic studies or, you know, Muslim or, or films that have Muslim or Islamic themes. So, uh, Carla, why don't you start us off? Um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, I have always been a horror movie fan, love horror movies. Um, and, um, you know, and I started, like, like I said, with this question, you know, what does Muslim horror look like? How is it different from, um, you know, Kind of quote unquote Western horror or American horror tropes that we're so used to, and um, you know, and I and I think that it's a genre. It's obviously a genre that's becoming increasingly important in terms of global cinema, um, and um, it, it's a genre that people are increasingly using to make statements. Um, I think you know, it's a place that you go. <laughs> excuse me. Uh, it's a place that you go for, um, it, you bring, it, it evokes fear because it feels good. It's a place where it feels safe to be fearful, right? It's a place where you go to order to have it an itch scratched in a way that is not actually going to threaten you, um, you know, or, or um, upend your, your worldview. Um, and it's a, a nice, you know, it allows a, pe people, it's a, you can create a nice cocktail that will allow a, a director to make a, a statement. I think that, um, Joko Anwar is actually one of my favorite directors out there. I love his, I thought Satan's Slaves was just 
just like a big, big piece of horror movie candy. Loved that movie. You know, I think that um, people like him who do like they, they, they mix a cocktail using these elements, these ingredients that are familiar to us if we know um, American horror, if we grew up on American horror, but he, he mixes them in an unfamiliar way. I love that, you know, because it's familiar yet strange. Um, and and I, I think that that's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. How about you, Eki? Why horror in a Muslim majority country? Uh, first, uh, uh, horror movies and Muslim culture on screen are both uh, my main uh, research interest. So combining them is my kind of heaven, you know, Muslim culture. And the second one, because for me, because I'm I'm also I'm also a Muslim, it makes it makes more uh, sense, yeah. And it's it's more believable because I can see in Indonesia there are so many practices and uh, you know rituals, and then. For me, for example, when I get scared, when like uh, something, I, I feel something uh, eerie, usually I recite the Quran and so on and so on. And that's what happened in the on screen. And, and that's more believable for me. Uh, rather than when I, I see, for example, a vampire or zombies or something, because, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it's, I live in the, this is, you know, it's in this kind of situation in the real life as well. Including the the rukia and so yeah, that's so interesting, and it reflects uh, Ruby's earlier point about what is known already by audiences and felt already um, implicitly by audiences in different parts of the world. Uh, so, uh, how about Ruby? Why horror? Why Muslim horror? Um, a, a combination, actually. It started with I love horror fiction, um, and I have since I was a child. Since I was way too young to actually probably be enjoying it. Uh, my parents would scold me for scaring myself all the time. Um, and then as an academic, I started researching um, uh, the Islamic identity in non-Muslim worlds, so uh, specifically second-generation Muslims growing up in North America, and how images of Islam affect them that they see reflected in film and in uh, television. Um, and the two started to overlap because I started seeing cultural relevances of Muslim themes in American horror film and horror... Um, themes, American horror themes or Western in um, uh, what we would call Muslim horror mo movies. And I love what, seeing that cross-cultural um, use of tropes on both sides. And so I started to look at how these films, because they are so popular, affect also the way people see themselves portrayed in these films. Um, and there is definitely more of a passion for uh, young people, especially uh, second generation to enjoy things like horror movies. And so they actually see uh, a sense of empowerment in movies like that, because usually it has to be another human one way or another who actually saves the day, um, be it a mom or be it a prayer, or be it a, a parent um, to, to basically save them. And so that in a sense uh, led me to uh, enjoying film from many, many different countries, uh, horror films specifically, because uh, it's my joy to love watching them. And I'm uh, thrilled that there is that uh, cultural um, uh, exchange between Muslim themes in American film and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Ali, how about you? Why horror or maybe why jinn or both? Yeah, I mean, they're related. So they, <laughs> there's a connection there. Uh, I'm, I'm fascinated with the way that we imagine the world around us. And horror is one way we do that imagining. So for me, it's really about the world that we create, whether through literature or film, through horror, through fantasy, through works of science, and how these things are all entangled with each other. I think that's a really great note to end on. Um, so thank you to all of our guest speakers today and to our audience members. And as a reminder, if you want to hear about similar events from Global Islamic Studies, sign up for our newsletter, which will be appearing in the, the link is in the chat. Thank you so much for attending everyone, especially those of you attending from different time zones. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. So good to see you. It was such a pleasure to be a part of this. I uh, hope to watch way more movies and uh, be a part of it again sometime. Absolutely. Thank you for having us. Next year. <laughs>